During World War II, massive prison complexes called concentration camps were formed on the territory of Germany and the countries it occupied. Millions of people were brought there, including both prisoners of war and civilians from the conquered territories. According to the recollections of the prisoners themselves, camp life was a hell. The prisoners were mocked in every way possible, humiliated, and subjected to inhuman medical experiments. The mortality rate was terrifying. But the subtlety of the Nazis knew no bounds. The most practical nation on earth looked for permanent ways to use prisoners for industrial purposes as well. The areas of research were striking in their most cynical originality. The experiments of the biologist professor Rudolf Spanner alone are worth mentioning. By conducting a series of experiments, the cruelty of which can be put on a pair with those of his colleague Joseph Mengele, Spanner came to the conclusion that human fat is ideal for the manufacture of soap. And the scientist's opinion that the best version of this product comes for some particular reason from Jewish fat, this opinion quite possibly was suggested to him by someone from above, and this idea immediately prompted him to leave for Stuttgart where he so enthusiastically set to work that he produced several dozen kilograms of soap. It is not known, however, how many people died in the process. In her apartment, Ilse Koch demonstrated furniture whose covers were made of human leather and books whose bindings were made of the same material. The half-mad sadist saw a particular aesthetic appeal in leather with tattoos imprinted on it. This helped her to remember, in addition to the additional decoration of interior items, exactly from whom the particular object was made of. And these were not the only projects that were realized, but almost the most unexpected ones, which, however, received the greatest application in the German industry were realized with the help of hair. Wagons full of hair. The Third Reich, with the development of the concentration camp system and its rapid infilling of prisoners, was faced with an acute shortage of fabric for sewing the necessary number of prison robes. The problem, which at first did not seem so serious in comparison with the challenges faced by the military, nevertheless had to be solved. And soon, the solution was found. It is known that human hair were used during World War I. At the same time, the German Red Cross launched a campaign to collect women's hair. The need for this appeared due to the shortage of camel fur, which was used in the German military industry to make felt pads for submarines. The fabric produced from the human hair were in no way inferior to that made from camel fur, which was the real solution to the problem. German textile mayors with ties to the Nazi upper classes reminded them of this story, adding that if human hair was good for making sturdy felt, it would certainly be good for making pants and coats. The textile factories near the concentration camps began to receive carefully packed loads. The tightly packed boxes were brought into the workshops, and only there were they allowed to be unpacked. The workers peered curiously inside the first one and squeaked in disgust. But the next second there was a shout from the foreman, and the stuff began unpacking the others. The calculations proved to be correct. So much hair was delivered from Auschwitz alone that it was enough for the smooth operation of several factories. The merchants themselves benefited in two ways. First, the problem of raw material shortages was now solved. And second, the price of hair was much more profitable, thanks to which the personal wealth of some textile factory owners increased dramatically. The Reichstag was also pleased with how one of its internal problems was being solved. At the highest demand, the shaving of concentration camp prisoners now became mandatory. The concentration camp administrations were instructed to equip their areas with special facilities for storing hair, which were already being sent in whole wagons to the ever-increasing production facilities. At the end of the war, soldiers recalled that they often stumbled upon these warehouses and were amazed at the enormous stacks that had accumulated there. In Auschwitz, for example, some 8 tons of human logs were found, already prepared for shipment to production. Moreover, as was noted after the subsequent laboratory tests, the hair did not always belong to living prisoners. Some of them contained impurities of chemical poisons, most notably cyclone B gas, which was used in the gas chambers in the killing of prisoners. 
Apparently, the concentration camp authorities, wishing to display a shocking pace of growth of those camps, decided to mix the hair, apparently unaware that the poisonous fumes of Cyclone B would not be weathered. The structure of the hair allowed it to be made into mostly coarse fabrics, so it was only used as a raw material for sewing prisoner uniforms. But the textile industry was given the go-ahead to develop in this direction. So soon hair was also learned to be used to make linings for Nazi German uniforms. A series of experiments led to the development of a process by which human hair could be processed into a thermal insulation, which was also widely used in the production of winter clothing for Wehrmacht soldiers. And a little later, the owners of mattress workshops stated that they also saw hair as an excellent material for the production of their products. The fact that their hair served as raw material for industry was not hidden from the camp prisoners, especially since some of them worked in those very textile factories. One of the women who went to Auschwitz with her mother and brother described, We were all shaved bald. They said it was for lice, but in fact the hair were disinfected and used to fill pillows for the soldiers. As it becomes clear, the processing of human hair into manufacturing products was becoming commonplace for the Third Reich. One can only shudder to think what other consumer goods manufacturers would have thought to make at their factories from human material. In particular, analyzing the documents related to the memories of eyewitnesses of that time, the following opinion has been clearly formed. A person who crossed the threshold of a cell in a concentration camp ceased to be perceived as a living being. It was anything, an object of mocking experiments, raw material for the production of something, but not a living human being. It was not only this, nonetheless, which was frightening. It seemed as if by an evil magic wand, the polished and respectable Nazi gentlemen who belonged to the elite of German society, who held high-profile ranks, lost their moral character in a second at the mere mention of the unfortunate prisoners. From somewhere suddenly appears a truly brutal cruelty, begins the flight of irrepressible crazy fantasy, which under the full approval of the highest leadership immediately gets permission for its practical application. But this was the weakness of the Third Reich, which inevitably pushed it toward collapse. While intimidating their enemies, they also intimidated their own people, specifically those who saw the unhealthy bloodlust and permissiveness of the Nazi scum. Subscribe for new videos.